Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome virtually to McNally Jackson. We're so thrilled to have you all here. We are so thrilled to be celebrating this wonderful book. So thank you all so much for um, being here with us. We're really thrilled to have you here. Um, so before we get started, I have a couple of minor housekeeping things. Um, we ask that during the event, you just remember to keep yourself muted just in case there's any rogue background noises. Um, and we are going to have time for questions tonight. So if there's anything you would like to ask, um, you can just put it in the Zoom chat um, and we'll, we'll get to it. And I really encourage you all to do that. Um, so by way of introduction, this wonderful book, They're Going to Love You, is A Million's Most Anticipated Book of 2022, a soul-stirring novel about love, loyalty, and one's lifelong relationship to art is how the Seattle Times, the Seattle Times described it. Um, Meg Harry is a former dancer who performed with the Joffrey Egeslovi, I do not think I pronounced that right, ballet and the, and the City Ballet of Los Angeles. She toured nationally with the Broadway production of Contact, for which she won the Ovation Award in 2001 for Best Featured Actress in a Musical. Harry is the author of two previous novels, Blind Sight and The Crane's Dance, and the co-author of the best-selling novels City of Dark Magic and City of Lost Dreams, published under the pen name Magnus Flight. Her nonfiction has appeared in Vogue and the Los Angeles Review of Books. She currently lives in Los Angeles. And she is here tonight in conversation with Stephen Rowley, who is the best-selling author of Lily and the Octopus, a Washington Post notable book of 2016. The editor, named by NPR and Esquire magazine as one of the best books of 2019. And The Gunkle, a Goodreads Choice Awards finalist for Novel of the Year and semi-finalist for the Thurber Prize at American Humor. His fiction has been published in 20 languages. He currently resides in Palm Springs with his husband, the writer Byron Lane. I'm going to put links to both of their books in the Zoom as well. So we hope you'll pick up copies. Um, and Stephen and Meg, I'm gonna hand over to you guys. Thank you so much. Meg, congratulations on uh, this stunning novel. It is such a long road to publication. How does it feel? Do you, can you take any time to enjoy this week? Is it overwhelming? How are you doing? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this and, and for McNally Jackson for having us. Um, you know, I, I said to myself a few months ago, this time I'm gonna be super cool <laughs> about it all. I'm not gonna be anxious or self-conscious or insecure. Um, so that's going as well as you might. You look cool, yeah. <laughs> oh, cool, yeah. No, it's not going great. Um, no, I'm taking it in, I'm enjoying it. Um, Yes, absolutely. But with all uh, the attendant weirdness of, of having a book out in the world. Well, uh, I don't know if you pay attention, but starred review in Publishers Weekly, starred review in Kirkus, starred review in the Library Journal, rave in the New York Times. Uh, do you pay attention to reviews and reception and all this? Or oh, do you do it only when it's good? Do you sort of look like the... I, I do that, yes. Yeah, I yeah, ask that... for, for friends and for publicists to filter. <laughs> well, I mean, you can't ask for a better trifecta than that. So uh, congratulations on this book, which I was lucky enough to read about probably about nine months ago, mm -hmm. I think, um, when you sent me an early copy. That's one of the great joys of being an author is getting to see early work uh, from, uh, from your author friends. Um, so you know, I just sort of want to start out. I want to talk about your background in, in dance a little bit, but maybe um, you could just give readers, I mean, it's brand new this week right. to the shelves, just a brief overview of the, of, the, of the book itself. Right, yes. So this book is about a woman, a choreographer, who receives word that her father, from whom she's estranged, is dying. And there's an opportunity for them to see each other probably one last time. And they haven't seen each other in 19 years. And so the book follows the course of this traveling back to her father. And of course, this, this event really brings her back to both the events of, that split them apart and really the course of her life with her father, their relationship and, and what it looked like. And 
we see her moving in one direction closer to her father and then in the other direction through time, through all the things that happened between them. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, we think of sort of mother-daughter stories uh, right. and father-son stories. And I wrote a complicated love story in The Editor, uh, which is about a mother and a son. Mm. Um, and I think father and daughter stories are really interesting, uh, interesting too. What, like, what is the, what, what do you think the, the sort of fascination or the interest is in, in there? Yes, I think it's so interesting. And I love that you've done that. And I think it's also interesting the really different expectations we put on mothers versus fathers, mm -hmm. and the different things that we ask of them. And of course, every family is um, its own, its own story, its own narrative. Uh, but in yes, in this story, it's really Carlyle's relationship both with her father and with her father's partner, who then becomes his husband, who is an important mentor. And so in addition to looking at the father and the daughter, I was interested in looking at our relationship with our mentors, the people that are incredibly important to us in our young lives, and how those relationships imprint on us in really mm -hmm. powerful ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I have some some questions that I have prepared. I just want to tell everyone, uh, please enter your questions uh, in the chat function too. We will get to questions from everyone. I would much rather talk about what you all want to hear about than uh, <laughs> to hear uh, me st perhaps steer our conversation off the cliff. But um, so please enter those questions and, and we will get to them um, shortly. But uh, you write so beautifully about New York in the 1980s, um, and it, it's so vivid and it comes to life. Um, just, just to harken back to the editor for a second, too, I was writing about New York in the early 1990s. Um, and I, in some stores, I had to laugh because I was in some bookstores, I don't know how it is at McNally Jackson, but I would find that book in the historical fiction section or that, uh, or people would reference it as historical fiction. And I know the definition is a little, is a little blurry. But how, you know, how hard is it to reach back, um, you know, just to the 1980s? Is, does that feel like another time? Was it fun to write, uh, to go back in time sort of there to, to write, despite some of the horrible things that were ravaging the city at the time? It's interesting when your youth suddenly becomes historical. Yeah, no, history. <laughs> <laughs> like we're running around in petticoats and, Right, you know. right. Yikes. Um, yes. I, I had really, you know, the time period was was really inspired a lot by the pandemic because mm -hmm. when I was thinking about the book, um, I knew always that I wanted to write about this kind of complicated um, love story and betrayal and uh, conflagration that happens between these people. But for a long time, I didn't know really who the people were or quite what the setting was. and. Um, and it was really pandemic and, and thinking about, among other things, a very different response mm -hmm. to the current health crisis than there was in the 80s to AIDS. And so when I started, when I thought I would set it, the childhood scenes in the 80s, it was fun to think back to, I moved to New York City when I was 15 in 1989 or eight. Mm. Um, and reaching back into what the city felt like and looked like to me then was really cool. Um, and brought up a lot of emotions too of that time in my life, which I, you know, I don't really actually think, I don't, I'm not a nostalgic person, so I don't really go back all that often. And it was, it was interesting and, and more fun than I thought to think about those years and who was important to me and how I felt walking those streets, you know, as a young person. Yeah. One of the other interesting things is as a writer, it sort of forces you to put characters together. There's mm. no texting. There's no, you know, <laughs> right. there's no cell phones. There's no email, all that stuff. To Risk have conversations, late. you have to, I know, you have to have them in a much more immediate uh, way. Did that yeah. sort of change the way you put, you threw your characters together versus in the, the other part of the story, which takes place in, in more current times? Yes. It's such a luxury to not have to deal with. <laughs> with texting or phones or computers or the way we all are constantly infiltrated with news um, now. So you can have the luxury, the beautiful luxury of having two people in a room talking to each other at length. <laughs> and I love that in books. I lo I, I've always loved that in your books, the way dialogue um, 
mm-hmm. is plot, is is the story. And um, it was a joy for these characters in particular, who was so fun to write, to really put them in situations where things are spilling out of them or not spilling out of them. And we watch what they're containing inside themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I always think, yeah, for me, you know, and you have a dual timeline, you have, you have definitely have a concrete story. I I'm not a plot heavy writer. So I am much more interested in the internal and emotional lives of my characters. So, so having them be together and forcing them to interact is always um, you know, the goal, and it can be a challenge in times when, when technology gives us all these excuses not to interact with each other. Right. Yes. I too am, am a, a plot, uh, uh, shy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's where all the interesting human exploration, uh, sort of comes from. Yes. Um, so, so I, I said, you know, at the top, I, I want to go back a little bit to your, um, experience mm. with dance. Will you talk a little bit about your, your dance career? Yes. So I, I would say I had enough of a career to justify the lack of cartilage in my knees, uh, <laughs> currently. but not so much of a one that I don't have imposter syndrome when someone refers to me as a former as ballet. Dancer, yeah. Because yeah. 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 I have a very distinct idea, as I think uh, Carlisle does, and I probably gave this to her for a reason, but a very distinct idea of what a real ballerina is. And and I certainly, I I grew up in a really small town and I started ballet right away. I had to leave home to get proper training. So I I ended up in New York really, really young and um, started dancing right after high school as a lot of dancers. You know, did in those days and um, had, you know, sort of a journey woman career in dance. I danced with Joffrey Ballet too and got to perform in the company and some other ballet companies and then did some theater dance. And that was all great and exciting. But I, I realized early on in a very scary moment that this thing that I, the only thing I knew how to do and the thing that I was trained for wasn't completely satisfying for me. And that was scary, um, but also interesting. I didn't think really that, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm a writer. I shall write novels now. Um, but I the, mean, wouldn't that be genius though? Because right, a dancer's career is short, sadly. Short, you know, yeah. The toll it takes on the body, it can, you know, it has an expiration date. But writers, presumably, as long as the mind holds up, you know, right. is a is something that we can actually get better at as we as we age. Yes. Um, so it would have been a genius uh, plan if you paired those uh, two things together purposefully. Yes. Although I didn't know. I mean, if you had said to me like even the words MFA to me when I was 22, I would I don't think I would have known what those letters meant. I was so removed. Yeah, I would have thought it would have been a mother effing something. Right, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, like you, I, like, I didn't come from Planet Writer and I had this very outsized idea of what a writer was and looked like. And I assumed they all went to college, they all had advanced degrees and knew from the beginning that they wanted to be writers the way I had wanted to be a dancer. So um, when I started writing, I I had been on a long tour. And so I came off tour and I finally had some money. So I wasn't chasing down the next gig and um, and my first computer. And I thought, oh, you know, I should say that the the only other thing I I had done in my life up till then was read books. I danced ballet and I read books. That was my life. And I had no idea, but, but the, all that reading was really training a writer inside me. Um, so when I sat down and thought, maybe I'll put the story that I've been thinking about into words, I was surprised that actually there was a technique that I had absorbed through reading as one does. And of course it took writing a book to figure out how to write yeah. a book. And I'm still figuring out how to write books. And um yeah, so that's my that's my well, career. That, if that's the career of an imposter, I you know I'd hate to see who <laughs> defi- actually defines themselves as a ballerina or a dancer, because uh, that sounds pretty impressive to me. I wonder, in fact, if if we overlapped, because I lived in New York um, 
98, 99, 2000, 2001. I saw contact. I was working for the Tony Awards, actually. Oh, cool. Uh, in 99 and 2000, uh, which was the best possible job, I thought, in New York, because I got to see everything. Everything. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. So I know I saw contact. I wonder if I saw you. I was on the tour, though. So I oh, you were on the tour. OK, yeah, maybe not. Well, let's you. just pretend. OK, you saw me. I was, in, I was I incredible. You. Yeah, you were great. Oh, my god, you were great. <laughs> <laughs> you are great. Um, I missed, I'm jumping all over, but I just want to say I missed live, the hard, The hardest part about this pandemic, uh, you know, for me was um, I missed out on live performance so, yeah. so much. And um, that was a real sort of loss and something I mourned, um, you know, time with family and friends in person and then, and then uh, missing out on live performance. With writing, you know, I felt so lucky as an artist, like still being able to express myself through my work, you know, because that couldn't stop. It's a kind of a solitary occupation. I can do it, you know, continue to do it um, and then connect with readers on Zoom and events like this and whatnot. But I feel for, for dancers, for actors, for singers and musicians and so who depend on, you know, sort of live events and audiences to be there uh, in person. Did it, did it change the way, were you able to experience any dance over that time? Are there other ways in which you can watch? Are there things that sort of something that struck you over the pandemic or someone who found a creative solution to the No, that's interesting. That it, it was really, I hadn't ever intended to write about dance again. I wrote it about it in my second book, The Crane's Dance. And I thought, well, you know, great. That's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, done. Um, and what more do I have to say really? And it really was pandemic. And, and, and during the pandemic, I, I was watching dance a lot online, just taped mm. performances yeah. and, and following dancers on social media. And I hadn't really been such an audi audience member for dance in, in a while. And, but of course we're so hungry for it. And I was so worried about these dancers, you know, giving themselves class in the kitchen. And it's, I thought, man, I, I'm so worried about them. And I was angry too at our country that does not support the arts properly. And there was so much, of course, we were all suffering through political mayhem and thinking, you know, these are American artists. These are mm -hmm. American jobs, just as much as in, you know, the jobs. Manufacturing that, or, yeah. sure, yeah. Yeah, no, no politician ever won an election standing up for the, you know, the lives of American artists, but. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, but there are a lot of them. And, and, and I was worried about the place of culture in American life. And do we get to, in the face of, you know, the pandemic and climate catastrophe and systemic inequality, do we get to care about the arts? It's, it's what I care about. It's what I need in my life. So it was really watching dance and following dancers again that made me think, okay, that I think the people in this story are dancers. And one of the things that I wanna do in the book is talk about making art in America and being an artist in America, not the sort of glamorous star version mm -hmm. of it, but what does the working life of someone who's got to get health insurance and make car payments and sometimes take crappy jobs that they don't care about and then hoping to get you know, into the conversation, be included, work with great people, the sort of continual goalpost moving that, that you do as an artist. And, and so that was a real directive for me in writing the book. For sure. Yeah. And the irony being to the extent that we have made progress in societal injustices and, and racial inequality and whatnot, our, our art often plays such a role in that. I mean, yeah. you know, it is hard to deny someone their humanity when you have heard them tell their story or seen the seen their story, you know, acted out in a way or, you know, it, it, it truly they go hand in hand. And so um, it's hard to discard art when talking about uh, some more serious issues that our country has been faced with. Right. It's the way that we can get inside the bodies yeah. of, of these people. Yeah. 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 Um, so I also wanted to ask, how does, you know, I, I don't have an MFA either. I feel like I am self-taught. I found, I, I, I find writing to be very, there's something that is very musical about it you know i always think about finding a rhythm or i hear a rhythm um you know as i'm composing prose and and so you know and it's i, I you know i really don't have a background as a musician 
um, uh, that much, a little bit, but not 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 as much as you were, you know, a dancer. But does dance inform your writing in a way? Are there things that you learn from dance that you can apply to the to the craft of writing? You know, I, I would on on my first answer is always there's completely different crafts. There's no mm. crossover whatsoever. Um, but I think digging a little deeper, yeah, there probably is something about both storytelling, which does happen, um, uh, although in a very different way, of course, and a relationship to music. Um, like you, I often think of the book as being a kind of score mm -hmm. and you hold it in your head, maybe the way a musician holds a piece of music in, the, in their head where you're constantly sort of moving back and forth within it and looking for those notes or those rhythms or those highs and lows and pitches and tones. And, and so maybe some of that too is in my brain. Um, well, there's such a precision to your, to your writing. There's such an, and, and, and such an elegance that, um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I really see kind of a, a crossover a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine you. those are qualities that are, are important to a, to a dancer as well. Yeah. Do you listen to music when you write? When I write, um, sometimes, sometimes I and, and it's it can be weird stuff. I have a new book coming out in May where I was weirdly influenced by the Carpenters for a while. Like I was remembering my mother listening to the Carpenters, you know, greatest right. hits of growing up with those out, you know, albums, like playing the records. And um, and it was just the right, it's so soothing and slow. I can't have anything with any kind of uh, percussion really or I, I, I say that ironically because she Karen was a drummer right. but uh you know sort of pound you know I can't have a pounding beat or a rhythm it has to right. it has to be soothing and I think in some in some right. way but I can't write in public weirdly I would even before the pandemic I was not like a go to a coffee shop because I'm so um sensitive to environment like if they're playing the wrong thing on the music or if it's too cold or hot uh you know right you know, yeah I mean, how about you? Did you have to adjust your writing routine over, particularly over the course of the pandemic? Um, I too write at home, although for a slightly mm -hmm. different reason. I, I act out everything that's happening as oh. I'm, yeah, <laughs> without realizing it, but I'm like constantly in the posture or, or trying to figure out what, what's happening with the character's body in the room while I'm writing the character. So it's, and probably making so much, so many faces. Um, so I like a little. So you privacy. might get kicked out of the coffee shop. Is that what you're would, saying? Yeah. It's security. Even, even in Los Angeles, I think I would get. You would stand out still. Stand out, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was fine. I was fine to um, to work at home, and uh, I do listen to music. I, I did listen to a ton. I listened to the Firebird, which mm. which plays a role in the book. Um, a, a lot with apologies to my neighbors who probably had to hear that damn score, you know, just yeah. on, on repeat. Um, <laughs> and normally wouldn't listen to anything because it's a monster score. It's a crazy um, score. I wouldn't listen to anything like that normally, but it was so, I just thought I'll just keep it going. So um, get it in my bones a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would yeah, remind everyone that they can add their questions to the chat and we'll get to them get to them shortly. But speaking of acting things out, one thing you and I have in common is we both narrated our own audiobooks for our most recent title. It was my first time doing it. I think it was your first time doing yes. it as well. Yes. How did you find how did you find the experience? Well, little backstory here for listeners. Um, when I got the gig, um, I called Stephen because I knew he had narrated the Gunkel um, fabulously. So I call I called him up and said, "Hey man, how'd you do that? <laughs> Any <laughs> tips?" <laughs> um, that was so interesting. I was, it was so for me first. Books, we had a very funny yeah conversation yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, we did. Um, and in, you were um, you were right about everything. Um, I uh, I. I was so glad that they let me for, for one thing. And, um, and it was the first time I really wanted to do it, I think, or felt like I could. And then I went in prepared for it to be this really exhausting, grueling thing. And it was not at all. It was this weird, very private um, 
I mean, it was strange, right? Because you're, you're reading your book out loud to no one. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't see the engineer <laughs> yeah. in the corner yeah. of his desk. The director's on the headphones, but she was quiet unless I screwed something up. And so it was this strange performance in a, in a, in a strange, quiet booth. And it felt really lovely. It felt like I was holding all these characters really close to me. And I was so grateful that I had this kind of last moment. Thing. And then later I tried to write about it for, for an essay because it, it was such an interesting, strange experience. Do you think you'd do it again for a book? Did you, are you hooked? I, I would have, it would have to be the right book, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I need to do it for, for every book. And then, and you know, I got some, some flack for it too, because uh, mm -hmm. a friend of mine uh, said, because you know, I had actors do my first two audiobooks. And, and so when I chose to do this one, I chose to do it in part because I felt very close to that character. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, we had a lot in common. I felt like, okay, this is one I could do. And it was something I wanted to try. And then a friend of mine said, you put an actor out of work during a pandemic? I thought, <laughs> I thought it was too, yeah. Oh no, I really yeah. did. Uh, right. So here I was asking you about artists surviving. Uh, yeah, right, right. Pandemic, took... And I'm, I'm part of the problem. Yeah, we took um, jobs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it was a really intimate experience. I really felt like I had lived the book in a way that I, I hadn't necessarily just while sort of writing it or composing it quietly in my head. But I'm okay. curious if you if you sort of acted out and are moving around a lot while writing, did you have to constrain yourself while performing a little bit? Because the microphone will pick up shuffling of clothes or if you you know you're if you're squeaking in your chair or whatnot. Completely. And I'm I cannot sit still. I am a constant stretcher. So um, no, I, I sort of, I knew that I could not do that. I choreographed for myself little tiny posture changes for each mm -hmm. character so that I could like sh slightly shift my body a little bit just to remind myself of the voices. Is um, there anything that the performer in you were sort of was angry at the writer in you for having, having crafted or made you do? <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, no, I was, you know, the last thing I do, I read, I read my own work out loud constantly just as a way to make sure that the grammar is correct, if nothing else, because if you stumble in a sentence, you've probably written it right. incorrectly. And the last thing I, I did with this book before I sent off the final version to my editor was read the whole thing out loud. And, and so it wasn't the first time that I had said all the words out loud. Oh, that's yeah. good. It changed my process, actually. I will never not read my work out loud from it because you hear it in such a different and yeah. unique uh, way that even when I'm not narrating the audiobook, because I, as soon as I was narrating, I kept calling my editor and be like, can we make, wait, wait, hold the, stop the presses. I want to make another change here or there. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, you always find a sentence that you think, yeah. oh man, woof. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, for me, too, it was I had given one of the two children in, in the story of the Gunkel, a six year old and a nine year old. And I, I had given the six year old a slight speech impediment. And I thought, oh, this I'm as a writer, I was like, oh, I'm such a genius because I don't have to tag every piece of dialogue. I don't have to write. He said, she said, Maisie said, right. Grant said, it'll be clear who's talking. But then it came time to narrate that, you know, in the audio booth. And I was like, son of a bitch. Like, who, <laughs> who did this? <laughs> um, so yes. That, that I, it was an experience. Do you think you would do it again? Would you have interest in doing it again? Are you ever going to write another book again? We should start <laughs> there. Because at the end of everyone, I've sort of gone like, oh, I don't have this in me again. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. There, okay. I, I, um, well, absolutely, I'm, uh, there will be more books. Um, no, I liked it so much. And now I wish, I hope it's really, it's like so good that people are like, wow, she's really good at that. Let's give her other books other audiobook jobs. Now I want the job. I now you want it. that job. Yeah, but let's yeah. read someone else's book. I know yeah, that because it seemed fun and easy. I sat in a room and I got to be by myself for a week, basically just right. reading. Like, well, that's not a, if that's not the dream, I don't know what is. They bring you free lunch. Yeah. Like yeah. meat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The only thing is I can't do it in Palm Springs again, you know, so here I am in the California desert where it gets you know, upwards of 115 degrees during the day. And they had to turn the air conditioning off for me because the microphone would pick it, pick up the sound of the air conditioning. So I had to sit and you know, occasionally like, what's that dripping sound? I'd be like, that is sweat falling off of my forehead. <laughs>
Amazing. Um, I see some great questions rolling in and I want to get to those and and reminder for everyone, please, please add some questions to the to the chat. We'll get them to, to them in just a minute. But I want to ask you about this beautiful cover because yeah. covers can be something that are so fraught uh, for yeah. authors. Like, you know, it's a really emotional experience seeing, uh, you know, a cover like that for the first time. Um, is this was this kind of an initial concept? Did you do you have lots of did you have input? Did you uh, how did you end up here? I did. Yes, there was a there were a couple of different ideas, um, mm. and they tried a couple. You know, they tried some different things, and then um, Emily Mahan. I think I'm pronouncing her last name right. Or Mahan. Mm -hmm. Hello, Emily, if you're out there. Um, she she came up with this and. Um, and played around with it and everyone just really fell in love with with the look of it so it took a little bit of time and then it all came together really beautifully yeah. and you have a stunning uk cover too i think right thank you yes yeah. yeah yeah different different very team. different they went a completely different direction um and uh, david mann did that cover and and so it was it was always neat to see like how an art department takes a vision of your book and in, in this case, I got very lucky both times with people who had cool ideas and really yeah. brought. Yeah. I think, you know, I don't know how it is for you, but I think sort of contractually, at least for me, authors have something called meaningful consultation. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, you know, define it's tried defining that in a court of law, you know, <laughs> like right. it means they can ask our opinions or if we have any ideas and then they can ignore our opinions and our ideas as well. Yes. So. And that's difficult. I, I mean, I don't make it easy on anyone because I have a lot of opinions about about what things look like, about, yeah. you know, art and stuff. So and <laughs> and I've gotten... I'm so relieved to hear you say that because I have a t I, I really yeah. press them hard and I'm Maybe. like oh my god I must be a nightmare to work with and then the weird thing about this job is I don't get to see anybody else do it so I don't get to see you how you interact with your editor and publisher and just you know and so I feel like wait am I am I really a nightmare <laughs> or or is this how it is for everyone because it's a very emotional experience yes. we might both be nightmares about it Ugh. Let's but be nightmares let's together. together. <laughs> it's something we can share. <laughs> it's something we can share. Um, I'm going to uh, jump to a few of these questions here. Um, I, I see one from uh, Margo. How long did it take to write this book? Also, hi, Margo. <laughs> um, that's always a, a little difficult to track because of I don't, do we count the time I spend thinking about the book before I started to write it? I'm a slow mm -hmm. boiler for novels. They, they, it takes, with everyone, about four or five months of thinking about it before I'll begin writing because I can't start it. I, I'm not a messy first draft person. It, it really needs to collect in my head before I can start. So there were months of, well, like I said, this, the plot had been in my head for years. Then there's thinking about, oh, okay, it's going to be dance. That's going to be the sort of architecture. These are the characters. Okay, this is how it's going to, these are the timelines. And then that's sitting with it for a while. And then probably about a year. Once I start, once I get going, it, it'll go straight through. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course, revisions and, and all of that. So about two years probably of working on it, top to finish. Yeah. Top, yeah. That's, Is that that's about really and each one, yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, to, uh, usually like a solid year um, of writing. And I'm not an outliner either. I mm -hmm. am the classic definition of a pantser, the <laughs> flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah. Um, or I actually like the, um, I forget who's, who said this now, some, some famous word, the, the sort of headlamp theory of, of writing, where it's like, you know, think of headlights on a car at night, like, I know what's going to happen about as far ahead as the mm. as the light shines, but beyond mm. that, I kind of am making it up as I go. But that can lead to some wrong turns and some having to backtrack um, right times. But right. for me, it's like the hard part is like you know, I, and I don't. Do, do you outline extensively, or is it all just sort of thinking up here before before the writing starts? I I don't do an outline in the way mm. I think most people think of an outline. It depends on the, the my last book, The Wanderers, was so much research that was. Mm -hmm of research um, and and that had a kind of a different process for it I don't outline at all until the very end when I 
I maybe we'll jot down a little chart for how I mm. want the ending to look like, but. Yeah, um, wait, I was gonna say something about, oh well, uh, it's, it's, it's gone, um, but uh, let's see. Oh yeah, you have written under a pen name as well. Yeah. Right? And so yes. what is the difference? How do you decide what you put out there in your name? How do you, uh, or the pen name is a, is a writing partnership or? Yes, um, the author, Christina Lynch, who mm -hmm. has um, a novel out under her own name called The Italian Party and a new one on the way, I believe. Um, she was a writer I met at a writer's retreat and she um, she and I decided it was it was almost a joke or a kind of dare between us. So we <laughs> <laughs> we came up with a crazy idea, um, basically from we thought, well, wait, why don't we write bestsellers like the Da Vinci Code? Right. That's like yeah. it would be fun. Um, and, and it was a kind of a joke process at first with us trading chapters. Um, and then it actually became a book and had a sequel. Um, but we both found it, it was great, it was fun. We really loved doing those books and, and having them out there in the world. But for both of us, I think we, we really needed to return to our own voices. So Magnus Flight, our pen name, um, he has disappeared. His whereabouts are unknown, <laughs> apparently. That's not saying yeah. he'll never return, but, but for the moment, uh, I, Magnus Flight is super successful too, which is interesting from for to have a, a a pen name who who actually has sold more books than more books. Oh, that's <laughs> fascinating. Can we be jealous of ourselves and some? I'm, yeah, I'm jealous of half of way. myself. Yeah. yeah, it's not uncommon now. I, I know that there are several. You know, because it's the thing. Like we can only publish so much, at what, but there are really prolific writers who are writing faster than they can put books out and are, are writing under some pen names too, or teaming up and. You know? Yeah. And I thought, wow, I wish I had that much energy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool process for sure to do. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I imagine it has to be the right collaborator. Can't, can't yes. just be anybody. Like, for instance, I think we'd have a lot of fun, but the poor publisher who would have to deal with twin nightmares like ourselves. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> They'd never get a cover. <laughs> They'd never be published without a cover. <laughs> Uh, yeah, here's a binder clip and some pages. Just send right. them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, somebody else. How long does he have to write Blind Sight? And and so, is it different for each book? Do, uh, are there like you mentioned a lot of research for one uh, yes. for uh, the Wanderers? And yes. um, so each each one, I have to imagine, is is an entirely different process. Is that I think so. Yeah, it has been for me so far. Each one feels different looks different. I've had a conversation with a friend about how, how the books, I don't know if you feel this way too, they are, of course, themselves, but they're also a record in a way of who you are and what you're mm -hmm. thinking of, your preoccupations at the time that you write them. So it makes sense that each book would be different as you move through time and you're in a different place in your life. Um, yeah, I think that I think that's so true. Um, this to jump back to the editor again for a second, because that's my book. I think that has sort of more in common with with yours um, is that it's about Jacqueline Onassis and her years as a as a book editor um, at uh, at Doubleday, right? Yeah. So at, at uh, yeah. so yeah, at your publisher. Um, yeah. So and and so to to write a historical figure like that takes an incredible amount of of research. Right. But the research that was so telling to me was reading the books that she was editing, while my story was taking my fictional story was taking place. Because yeah, I do cool. think that is the record of someone's mind is what they are reading in that moment and what were the manuscripts on her desk? What were the ideas that in the forefront of her mind? What was she interested in in those moments? And I think yeah. you're, it's so true of writing a book too. Like those, you know, it's an input output endeavor. Yeah. And so you, you see all that, what came into your life in that time that made it onto the page as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. This is a very, uh, uh, this is a specific question um, from Sarah about, uh, uh, maybe maybe a relation uh, about uh, they're going to love you. Uh, but does Carlisle, the main character, with uh, his father and partner, live in the same area of New York where you lived? Is that that? Sort oh. of, was it Bank Street? Where are they? Banks, they're in Bank yeah. Street. Yeah. No, I never lived. I never lived in the village. Um, but it was a yes. I, I spent a lot of time there and um, growing up. 
Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's for anyone who knows New York City, that's a particularly mm. magical part of New York. It holds yeah. a lot of memories for me. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, did you have to do research about the 80s um, to confirm that your memories, aha, this is interesting. Yeah, how much do you rely on memory and how much do you have to back that up with research to make sure that your memories are accurate? Well, in this case, the it's pretty contained. We don't, we step outside. It's pretty contained within the family and what's going on between mm -hmm. these people. So there's, there aren't huge outside references to what's happening. I, of course, had to really look at the timeline of AIDS and when and, mm -hmm. and sort of track again, okay, what was happening in 1983 with drugs, with the response from the government? When, when are these things happening? So that research was definitely a part of it. And, and for someone who spent a lot of years as a ballet dancer, I had to do research on, on some ballets too, because I thought, wait a second, I, I, I gave Carlisle this job, um, potential job, um, uh, re-envisioning Firebird, and that's not a ballet I ever danced and didn't really know that well. So I had to do, I had to do ballet research as well. That's really, that's, yeah. that's really fascinating. These are great questions, uh, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Um, I love this. The phrase kill your darlings for anyone who's not familiar with this as a, as a writer is that so many, like we get enchanted with something we write, even if it's not exactly right, cor right, correct for mm. this book or doesn't fit, but we have such a hard time cutting it out because it's a beautiful piece of writing. It's a beautiful turn of phrase or something. Did you have a lot of the sort of kill your darlings moments with this book? And how, what is it like to work with your, what is your relationship like with your editor? Unless he or she is here. And then you can tell me privately later. <laughs> um, I am, I think, um, a good murderess of mm. my own sentences uh. and am, am always happy when I can. I, I can hear Chicago now, like they had it coming, <laughs> boom, boom, they had it coming. I'm gonna have to pay royalties now for singing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, totally. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm usually happy to hack away. Of course, like, like every writer, uh, there's some dumb thing that for some reason I'm in love with. And, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm hugely lucky with my editor um, who asked me at the top of our relationship, how do you like, this to go with, with notes, with feedback, which was incredibly sensitive and very useful. Yeah. And, um, and we stuck to that and she was just really great, just found the places to push me uh, when I needed to be pushed in a really elegant and thoughtful way. And, um, and I sort of feel like together we found what those darlings were mm. and, and also things that I had I, places where I had cut too much and she was like, no, we really need, we need to know more about this. Oh, moment. You are good with a machete. <laughs> so yeah. So she pushed me to add some things that I'm really glad got added to the book. Yeah. That that's so wonderful that your editor asked that um, because yeah. it, it, I don't think, you know, editors, they're, they're so incredible. Obviously I wrote a book called the editor are celebrating editors. What they do is right. we couldn't do what we do without, without them doing what they do. Um, but, and, and mine is a, a genius and has improved, you know, my books, but sometimes I, I'm sitting there wondering, like, do you truly understand how needy we writers can be? Like, please, please, please be gentle. Right, right. Everyone has a different way that, you know, that feels a different way they can take notes in. So she, yeah. she actually took the time to say, what's going to be the way for, for you to receive notes? What's the best? Yeah. That was cool. Yeah, that is great. Yeah, what's the best way for you to hear them as well? Yeah. So they so they sink in. Uh, it's a, a question from my friend Carol Ann uh, Tack. Hi, Carol Ann. Uh, Hi. Your prose is so gorgeous, and I have so many highlighted sentences that when I'm supposed to have bifocal or progressive lenses, but I don't. Uh, so many highlighted sentences when I listen to your audio, I raced ahead to hear my favorite sentences. Just terrific. Oh, so, thank you. I, Gosh. Yeah, I guess that wasn't a question so much. It's just wonderful praise for you. I mean, I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Yay. Yay. Um, just praise. Yeah. Just praise. Yeah. <laughs> just praise. Um, 
let's say I want to go back to my uh, the, oh I, you know one thing I wanted to ask you is that you know and again we're not going to spoil anything because the book is brand new and I imagine a lot of people haven't had a chance to read it yet um, and boy are you in for a treat uh, but there is an act of betrayal in this yeah. book and I, I'm not going to say what it is or anything but I wanted to ask you do, if you feel sympathy for all of your characters um, and how do you uh, maintain the sort of a tenderness towards them, even when they're behaving uh, as they should or do something, you know, that uh, you would not approve of. Right, right. It's a good question. I, I always wanted this particular act of betrayal to be one where everyone makes a mistake and no one, no one behaves mm. perfectly. And, and the reader could choose to shift alliances or may find themselves, you know, changing their mind about who, how badly one person did one thing. And I was interested too in, in how, what can be maybe a small mistake or a betrayal that seems easily forgiven can just get compounded when what we're protecting in ourselves about it is so deep in our identities. I mean, the things that people in this book are fighting for, it's not just the betrayal, it's mm. all these sort of other things that fish hook into their lives. Um, so I always wanted it to have that, that balance of everyone's at fault here and everyone yeah. should be forgiven too. Um, and I absolutely take everyone's side the moment I'm writing their point of view. So that was easy to do because as I shifted into each, each viewpoint, this completely. Yeah. I, there's a character in the Gunkel that, that readers do not like, and I hear about it. <laughs> often and I have such sympathy for this character because I feel like you know, I feel like she's maligned in a way and and like you know my intent is it's more interesting to write people who are who are hurt who are going through something who are grieving something and, and maybe as a result of that don't behave correctly or you know that's it's always more interesting to to fully flesh out someone's motivations than just creating sort of like a stock Right. villain or someone who just purely does bad things because you're right, right. The, tr the truth of it is we're all very complicated and flawed yes i always think about how actors you know they don't play villains mm -hmm. villains don't think of themselves as villains. This villain unless, yeah unless it's you know <laughs> unless they're a sociopath or whatever but um yeah the, you, you i could argue the points of view of each of these characters um you know yeah. if somebody, and, if somebody and, came and, after them i would <laughs> i could say yeah, that, oh, that would be yeah. yeah. That would be that is a great premise for somebody. Yeah, having to be a, a, a defense attorney for each of for you your know, author having to be a defense attorney for one of their characters sort of come to life. That would be really, sure. wait. No one steal that. <laughs> I'm working something out here. Write write that down. <laughs> yeah, write that down quickly. Um, I you know I wanted to ask um, as well and sort of bring this back to um, you know circle back as as we're sort of running out of time. If, and if there are any more questions, please please include them. Um, in the chat, uh, but I wanted to ask about about mentors because it is you know the, the relationship between Carlisle and James is such you know it, it, you know mentors play such a huge huge role in our lives and we were talking about fathers and daughters but surrogate uh, you know parent figures sometimes and mentors are are so um, um, you know imp important figures in our lives like did you did you have a mentor are there mentors in your life and in your life anyone you want to shout out. Uh, while you're, uh, yeah, while we're here. I, I had several different mentors, people that were important to me. Um, and I, I love that relationship. It's, it's interesting to dig into um, because it can be dangerous too, uh, that mentor relationship. There's an interesting power balance that, that slides back and forth um, between mentor and mentee. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting to look at this particular relationship and how much Carla loves the character, loves James. And, um, and I think, well, it was an interesting place to go in my mind to thinking about the, the way I responded to mentors as a young person, how greedy I was for everything that they had and how they often treated me as a friend and I was not you know, I wasn't a friend. I was 
an acolyte. I didn't know how to be a friend at that point in my life. It's a, a, an imbalance on both sides, but also yeah. so exciting and, and rich in many ways. Yeah. yeah. It really is, yeah, a, a fascinating uh, relationship. In part, as, as you say, because it is, it can be ripe for for abuse and for yeah. uh, for it to go wrong as well. Um, I, I sort of want to finish here uh, by asking if you have uh, either other books or media that you love about, you know, sort of fictional work about dance uh, or other dance themed books that you that you love or a movie or or whatnot. Either because you just love it or because it got things just right i mean and those are probably two different things yes they are i think they are right yeah. um because i'm a terrible reader of other dance fiction mm. i should be so generous and i'm not <laughs> I'm super grumpy about it um and and that's wrong i'm not i'm not proud of that the the movies that i've loved um were of course the red shoes mm -hmm. because it's perfection it's glorious campy ridiculous perfection um and the turning point which i loved as a mm. as a, i was really young when it came out but um but had real dancers in it which was you know super important and and the director knew how to shoot dance so you get you get to see it um yeah. in, this, in this glorious way and white knights because you know barishnikov mm, was yep. yep. Oh my God! We were, you know, it was our first Before love. Before he was on Sex in the City, he, yes. well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all had the poster. So, yeah. so those are the the movies I love. I'm sympathetic to to the um, love that people have for some of the <laughs> juicier, sillier ballet movies. That I yeah. mean, I, they're fun, um, but I sit there in a very uh, grumpy way. Off, off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but I I loved the uh, uh, Megan Abbott's the, the turnout last year, and I know nothing about that. So it. it could be, yeah. um, but it has, has more of a suspense suspense element too. That's so. right. That's right. Yeah. And there's yeah. so much great. There's great. I mean, to, um, uh, uh, Tony Bentley has a book out now called Sarah Nod. It's nonfiction, um, and mm -hmm. she's a fantastic writer. Jennifer Homans, of course, is this great um, biographer of dance. So there's there's terrific. Fabulous. Oh, right? yeah. I didn't even think of Yeah. There are, I'm sure, some autobiographies too that are really. Yeah. Does Martha Graham have one? I can't remember. Kind of, but... There's an, I think there's a new book about her out. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, anybody else? Last chance for questions. Question. If not, um, I want to thank uh, McNally Jackson for hosting us this evening and for everyone here for showing up and supporting independent bookstores. It has been a rough couple of years for our independents, and we need them not only to survive but to thrive um you know because they're such important parts of our communities and hosting great programming like like this and one benefit of of zoom culture is that we can sort of tune in from everywhere even if you don't have an independent bookstore in your neighborhood that might bring authors to you um that you can hopefully find us somewhere and support another uh another bookstore and if you have a chance to buy uh meg's book uh it is truly fantastic you're in for a treat or um, and uh, I, it's just been such a joy to, to talk to you and um, to see the reception that, that this book is getting. It's, it's, so, it's so thrilling to watch from the sidelines, and I'm not at all jealous. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this with me, and you know I'm a fan, and, and I'm, I'm so appreciative, and thank you, McNally Jackson. Um, we, are, we really wish we could be there in person, but thank you so much for supporting the book and for all of you for coming and, and yeah, helping me celebrate this thing. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you both. Thank you, Meg, for, for launching this book with us. We're so thrilled we could do it. And Stephen, that was such a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you all so much for coming. I've put the link to buy Meg's book in the chat. If you're in New York, we have copies at all of our stores. We have Stephen's books at all of our stores. So yeah. do swing by and, and pick one up and congratulations again. Thank you so much, everyone. It's always um very horrible and abrupt when I end these. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> you, Cutting us off. <laughs> Thank you again. That was wonderful. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take Thanks care. So Bye.